Bonjour. Uh, my squad is good. There's the cars. Uh, washed up. Coach Fiar. Pichi. Back to the dad. Mom P. Matchy Badash US. He's in the closet. Buddha out of me and a snob head in the end, though. Bavarian. Jaganash. G Jock. And CK and all them. Chair, chair, and uh, mon uh, What I said was to you is hello to you all. Um, my spirit name is Red Cloud. Uh, my English name is Frank Sprague. And uh, I, I was born and raised here in this region, uh, specifically where the rapids used to be. <laughs> um, and my paperwork, or I, I belong to the the Turtle Clan people of the great Potawatomi Nation, specifically the Gun Lake Band of Potawatomi people. Um, and I also said that it was very honored to be here. Um, I was given tobacco to sing an opening song uh, for this. I wanna thank Rachel and her team and for everybody here that's been volunteering and putting this on. This is great work. This is stuff that I'm learning. And uh, one of my favorite parts about this is our food is our medicine. That's the one thing that I've been learning and passing on in this good way. And if it wasn't for these beautiful minds, you know, I would be still out there eating McDonald's and stuff like that. Um, so this song was given to me about 25 years ago uh, from one of my mentors, uh, Jack Swanson. And uh, his spirit name is Zonga Wei Gabo, uh, stands in the sounds of thunder. And he told me that this song isn't used for like 49s or powwows or, you know, places like that. This is a very specific, very special song, and it's a spirit calling song. And uh, so that's where that so this song belongs. I know that there's gonna be recording on this and hopefully in the future that people honor this tradition in that good way. So this is a, if we all, if you're able to, if we could stand, gentlemen, remove your hats. Hi, oh, hi. 
to the Decolonizing Diet Project speaker event tonight. My name is Tari Maddox. I'm the faculty advisor for the Native American Student Organization here at Grand Rapids Community College. We are here today on the lands of the Anishinaabe, the original people, the people of the three fires, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Padawatomi. This event is part of GRCC's Native American Student Organization's Education and Reconciliation Project, which was funded by a grant from the Native American Student or Native American Heritage Fund in 2019. Uh, the goal of the project was to create opportunities for student, faculty, staff, and the greater GRCC community to learn about Anishinaabe history and heritage, and to use this dialogue to foster or use this knowledge to foster dialogue, action, and to move towards reconciliation and healing. The first phase of this project was in fall of 2019, where the GRCC community uh, took a trip to the Zibawing Center of Anishinaabe Culture and Lifeways in Mount Pleasant, where we learned the truth about the former Mount Pleasant Industrial Indian School. The event today is the second phase of the grant where we will learn about the Decolonizing Diet Project and explore the relationship between the community and indigenous foods of the Great Lakes region. Uh, this speaker event and cooking demo was originally scheduled for winter of 2020 uh, and then rescheduled for fall of 2020. And then I'm not sure if we even tried to reschedule it for winter of 2021, but uh, here we are. After a long COVID pause, we are grateful to be able to uh, explore the second part of this grant. We are honored today to be joined by uh, Dr. Martin Reinhardt and Tina Moses, uh, Marty, and, and they are joining us virtually from uh, up north. Uh, Marty and Tina are Anishinaabe Ojibwe citizens of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. Dr. Reinhardt is a professor of Native American Studies at Northern Michigan University, and he serves as the president of the Michigan Indian Educational Count Education Council. Mrs. Moses is co-owner and manager of Reinhardt and Associates, and together their research focuses on revitalizing relationships between humans and indigenous plants and animals of the greater Great Lakes region. We are also honored to be joined by uh, Cameron Stott, who is a member of the Little Traverse Bay Band of Odawa Indians. He is a community food activist, a, a GVSU and NASA, uh, the Native American Student Association at Grand Valley um, uh, member. He is a student who's studying environmental science at Grand Valley. Uh, and uh, Cameron runs workshops on practicing intertribal food so sovereignty, uh, often through Blanford Nature Center. We are also honored to, to welcome back Mariah Williams. And, and you can both come up here. You don't have to hide on the sides over there. Please come join us. <laughs> Cameron and Mariah. Uh, they have cooked the food that we'll be sampling today and demoing today. Uh, Mariah is a member of the Pokagon uh, Band of Potawatomi Indians. She is, was the former faculty advisor to uh, the Native American Student Organization. And she was one of the original or maybe the original author of this grant, the Education and Reconciliation Project grant. Uh, Mariah currently works as youth specialist, as a youth specialist for the Gun Lake Tribe. She is also a graduate student at Northern Michigan University working towards a master's in indigenous education. And then finally, of course, we are deeply honored to have uh, Frank join us today and he has introduced himself. <laughs> uh, 
Our program today, following this opening and introductions, we will have a cooking demonstration by uh, Cameron and Mariah. And uh, after the demonstration, we'll have a short 15 minute break where the in-person uh, participants uh, are going to have an opportunity to sample some of the food that Mariah and Cameron have cooked for us today. Uh, and then after this 15 minute break, Dr. Uh, uh, Martin Reinhardt will discuss the decolonizing diet project. This will be followed by a short Q&A uh, with all the participants. Throughout the evening, I encourage the virtual participants uh, to submit questions via the Q&A tab on your webinar. And then we also encourage in-person uh, participants to engage and ask questions using this mic, which will be floating around the room. So because we have, this is a, a unique event in the sense of we have virtual and live speakers and virtual and live participants. So uh, please bear with us as we negotiate that uh, complexity. Uh, before we get this long overdue event, event underway, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Sekia Institute for Culinary Education and Chef Werner, please come and wave for uh, facilitating this multi-sensory exploration of indigenous food. Thank you, Chef Werner. Um, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge someone who might be running around. Nope, she's, she's in here, um, who's been instrumental in seeing this project to fruition for the GRCC community. Rachel Beecher, please come down here. Rachel is the president of the Native American Student Organization. And for the last two years, she's thrown her heart and soul into this grant work. And we are very grateful for her commitment. Yep. And we have a little gift for you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And with that, I will hand it off to uh, Chef Mariah and Chef Cameron. You want to start? Um, Buju, my name is Mariah Williams. I um, was in Professor Reinhardt's class last summer and the Decolonizing Diet Project, and I just fell in love with the ideal and the complexity and the simplicity of the food that comes from this program. So I'm excited to be sharing it with you. Yeah, um, I'm Cameron Stott. Um, I worked in the culinary world for a long time and I finally made the transition into um, indigenous food sovereignty work. And um, I've been doing it ever since. Uh, I'm a member of I Collective and I, I, I do work through them typically. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm first dish. All right. All right. So this is one of the dishes uh, from the Decolonizing Diet Cookbook that uh, we prepared for you today, but I just wanted to like kind of walk you through the process. Um, so we have our corn noodles, which uh, for the sake of, you know, for time's sake, we pre uh, cook the noodles. But um, so the ingredients that we have are, we have the corn noodles, we have uh, sliced up leeks, summer squash, We have rehydrated morels and oyster mushrooms. Some turkey. And baby corn. So we chose this dish uh, because it is like a really easy to assemble like family meal. And I think the best part about the decolonizing diet cookbook is it's like everyday dishes that are like still have decolonized ingredients, but are like accessible for people to like cook at home. So after half it or time technology. Why are you still doing that? And it's still going. It's German engineering, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I 
just gonna keep clicking. Thank you. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you. Wonderful. So, um, a little bit of uh, what we're using today is safflower oil or sunflower oil. Uh, if you don't can't get access to that, uh, any type of neutral oil is fine. So we're just gonna wait for that to heat up. Your gas still on? Okay. So the first thing that we're gonna do is I'm gonna grab my squash. I'm gonna saute that up first. Finding the food to cook in this. What's one of the greatest challenges of finding the food to cook? Uh, sourcing ingredients are is really hard, especially like when you try to do it in like a professional culinary setting and like you're feeding like a large amount of people. Um, these ingredients were meant to be intimate. You know, uh, it is really hard to cook for a lot of people. And I am always really thankful that like to be able to do that when I can, but mostly like, like that is meant to be for like intimate gathering. So it is nice when we have it, but not very often. Okay. So I'm gonna add in the mushrooms now and the rehydrated morels. Is there a difference between using fresh morels and rehydrated morels? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I would think that there is a difference in flavor, but like rehydrated morels are probably the more sensible route because the season is so short mm -hmm. that I, I mean, these taste just fine. They taste just as good to me. <clears throat> I, I... So we have a question, Dr. Reinhardt. What's your opinion on the use of fresh versus rehydrated mushrooms? Yeah, I, I think kind of like Cam says, you know, the uh, there's good points about both. You know, you get that nice fresh taste in the springtime when you have your, uh, your fresh morels. Of course, you know, you got to be real careful that you get all the sand out of them and, you know, the debris. So you want to cut them open and, you know, wash them real good. Uh, but you do, you get that real nice, fresh spring taste. But, you know, the dehydrated morels are also very tasty. And they actually take on a little bit of a different taste when they're, when they're dried. And the other thing is you, you can't get them all year fresh, right? So if you're really going to, you know, do this on a daily basis and you're going to try to feed your family, uh, you know, year round, you're gonna to wanna to dry them. And, you know, that's certainly something that those of uh, native people who had uh, like a mushroom eating tradition in their community, that's what they would have done. You know, they would have dried these out for use later on. So I think if you're gonna get the taste of our ancestors, you're gonna do wanna to do both. And as far as the corn noodles, uh, corn noodles are easier to cook. It takes less time, but they also tend to get very mushy if you um, let them sit for very long. Over, yeah, if you overcook them. <laughs> one of our favorite dishes, by the way, Cam yes, and Mariah. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Uh, looks like we also had a question in the Q&A. Uh, how are corn noodles made? So I, I think the question may be related to where do corn noodles come from, or it could be how do you prepare them? So we could probably deal with both of those. You guys want to take that on? It'd be the corn flour, just like you would use a wheat flour, but instead you'd use a corn flour to make them. Finally, add yeah. the noodles. And there are uh, different products out there. Uh, we prefer the, the straight up corn noodles. And, uh, you know, there are also a mix of rice and corn and there's corn and beans and, you know, there's different uh, products out there. So when we make ours, we always use the straight up corn and we use our organic corn noodles. And but honestly, we did try to make our own noodles, corn noodles at one point, along with wild rice noodles and different kinds mm -hmm. of uh, um, indigenous products. And they didn't turn out very well. So we were really <laughs> happy when we found that we could get them on the market. 
they were they were pretty tasty mm -hmm. but they're kind of big and dry yeah you know so and it's a lot of work so we we're we were very happy to find corn noodles on the market yeah so this really just is as simple as like like if you can search the ingredients uh it really is just putting everything together it's like a really simple family meal it's it's quick to make um i really like this meal in the addition of like you can get morales Amazing. Mariah, are those spices that you guys are going to put into? Um, these are actually some of the spices that have been put in. Um, one of them is the DDP spice blend. And so I have um, some of the ingredients for that here. And one of them is sweet fern. And that, um, you know, you're out in the woods and you don't really think about that being one of your ingredients. But like Cam said, it's almost like a basil. Um, so it adds a lot of flavor and depth. One of the other things we have is inulin powder that goes in the DDP spice blend. And inulin powder um, is derived from beautiful Jerusalem artichoke flowers. If you're driving out and you look along the side of the roads, you're going to see these beautiful smaller sunflowers, but they're tall. That's where they come from. We didn't historically eat potatoes. We would have ate these. Um, and That's so it's a nice root. addition That's to the have. root of the sunchoke. Yep. Okay. And then we also have the um, dried leek salt. So if you mix those three items together, you're going to have the DDP spice blend. And so it's yeah, the fern, the inulin. Can you tilt that towards the camera, maybe? And tilt it towards, there we go. You can see. Excellent. Very nice, thank you. All right. Then the next set of ingredients we have um, pertains to the beverage we'll be having, but I'll talk to about that in a minute. Looks like you're ready. Yep. So like, very simple to put together, but it's really good. Looks beautiful. Making us hungry, Cam. <laughs> There are a few questions in the q and I just want to make sure we uh, pay attention to those. Um, so you you want to tackle those first, Dr. Martin? Yeah, let's just uh, get these uh, out there real quick. Uh, so someone was saying, uh, where can you find the corn noodles? Uh, you can like find them oftentimes in the, uh, uh, like in our co-op, uh, they will carry them. And uh, you can also order them online. And you know, it used to be that the local marketplace here in Marquette carried them, but then they started only like uh, having corn and uh, rice pasta. So sometimes I think it's a matter of uh, you know the demand in the area. If the if the if you know that there's going to be folks buying them, then what we did is we worked with the uh, local grocers and just said, hey, you know, can you get these for us? And they were very uh, good at getting them. Uh, someone asked uh, chicory. Or someone says chicory can also be used for inulin sourcing. I'm not. Mm -hmm. Is that a local store down there? At what store? I didn't hear the name. Uh, it looks like chicory online. C H I C H O R Y. Is that a local store down there? Or online? No, I know chicory root. Are they? I believe they're talking about chicory root, like that you'd make the. Coffee oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, like actual yeah. chicory. Got it. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that is delicious, and that is a good substitute. Yeah, you can find that, I think, like at Whole Foods. Harvest Health, I know how Harvest Health. It. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, someone wants to know where they can get the cookbook, and I think we'll have information uh, that you guys can share with them right there. But as far as uh, if you're looking online, uh, if you go to the Northern Michigan University Bookstore, or you can contact Reinhardt Associates uh, net. So, Dr. Martin, my question was, <clears throat> obviously, you did research on indigenous foods and the health effects on Native American peoples. Can you talk a little bit more about what the difference is between this dish and the dish I would buy in an uh, Italian restaurant? Yeah, so, you know, one of the really cool features of what uh, Cam and Mariah just made there is it's gluten free. You know, so that's one of the, the main things. There's a lot of people who have gluten intolerances and, you know, it's also dairy free. 
And so in, especially in Indian communities, we have a lot of um, folks who have a uh, lactose intolerance and, you know, that's uh, even more common nowadays than it used to be. And, you know, the other thing that you think about is not just human health, but health to the environment. You know, the more, I always like to say, the more people eat locally and the more they eat indigenously, that's the healthiest you can eat. And so, you know, try to try to source these things as local as you can, but also try to source them indigenously. And I think that'll help us uh, help the health of the environment. You know, so thinking about human health and environmental health, uh, local. And, you know, I, I think the other thing is the plants and animals that are in your area. If you start looking at them as life sources, you know, then you start to take care of them better. If you guys would like to continue with the demo. I'll talk about the super juice. Um, so one thing, Cam does more of the specialty foods and my, my niches is I try to incorporate it into our everyday meals as a mom. So bringing that into our home um, and enjoying that with my family and my relatives and the people I love is really special to me. And one thing we made this evening is super juice. <laughs> this is really good. I'm just gonna read the recipe to you um, so you understand. It's two quarts water, a handful of white pine needles, a handful of wintergreen leaves, a quarter cup of cranberry juice concentrate to taste, and a half a cup of sweet water. Sweet water is um, just water that has been warmed up and you add some maple syrup to it. And so that all together makes the beverage down here. But I just love, um, I love the recipe, it's just a handful. So, you know, every time it'll be a little different, every time it'll be kind of the same. You might not have all the ingredients or you might decide to add something else. So it's always up to you, it's what you have on hand. And that's how cooking is when you do it um, indigenously from the region you're at. You're gonna use what's on hand. So I have um, some samples right here. And this is wintergreen, this was harvested up in the UP. And if you make just tea out of it, my kids always say it just tastes like gum water because it is it is just like wintergreen gum. So it's wonderful. And then it was really just pine needles that I got from, from my pine tree. So um, the ingredients are out there. That's the most exciting part for me is also foraging. I love to be out in the woods. I love to go find new things. I love to just see stuff as I'm driving down the road and stop. <laughs> it gets me excited. So I'm glad to share this with you. Thank you, Mariah. No problem. I guess we'll just, we just wanted to add something real quick. Uh, I know folks, you can get uh, maple syrup on the market, but make sure it's real maple syrup and try to get it from local sources too, yeah? I agree with that. Um, so what else we made today too is uh, the pumpkin cornbread. So for the pumpkin cornbread, uh, the best part about this cornbread is that um, the um, flour that substituted for like like um, all-purpose flour to make it gluten-free is um, pulsed up um, seeded um, pumpkin pumpkin <laughs> pumpkin seeds. So it's pulsed up into a flour, and so it gives it like this like thick consistency uh, that makes up for the fact that there's no gluten in it, and so. Uh, I added a, a bit of pumpkin puree because we had it on hand to it to give it the, that nice color. But there's um, corn. There's also corn in it, and I, I like I, I've made this for myself at home when I was um, doing the decolonized diet myself. Uh, and then this is literally all I, I would eat. Like I would recommend this like for breakfast. Like I would cut off a slice like as a substitute for toast and like put like. Um, brisket and like an over easy egg on top like it's so good <laughs> the, the duck eggs so sorry chef you mentioned you know over easy egg right can you talk a little bit about the eggs that are in there oh to make it completely decolonized uh we use duck eggs as a substitute for chicken eggs which also like kind of helps with um, the fact that there's not gluten in it or like baking soda, um, the, 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 the duck eggs make it really fluffy. And so the, the substitution of duck eggs in this really, really made it 
And I think the thing I really like about it is uh, every bite is really dense with nutrients and things that um, are essential to your body. Like having that um, pumpkin flour in there really helps make it not just a quick, fast carb bread, but something that stays with you. Right. It's very nutrient dense, like in comparison to like regular cornbread. Mm -hmm. We also substituted like sugar. So it's still sweet, but we substituted like regular um, granulated sugar with maple, uh, maple sugar instead. And so like that kind of gives it that like developed smoky, like sweet taste to it. It's just like completely nutrient dense. This is my favorite thing, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. And you will, once you experiment with some of the recipes, you will find your favorites and you'll keep incorporating them. Um, it's just a wonderful thing to have on hand. So we have some samples over here of the pumpkin seed, the pumpkin seed flour. And then right here, this is the maple sugar. The maple sugar is a labor of love. And it's really, you can taste every ounce of energy that's been put into it. It's a beautiful food. And then we do have the dried morels here for you to see also. We have a few questions from the uh, Q&A. Uh, one person says, what is the name of the recipe book? That's the Decolonizing Diet Project Cookbook. Decolonizing Diet Project Cookbook. Uh, someone else, uh, Claudine says, sounds refreshing. Are there any specific health benefits of wintergreen or pine needles? Uh, one thing I can tell you, Claudine, is that the amount of vitamin C that you get from wintergreen and pine needles is like 10 times what you would get from a, a similarly uh, a volume of orange juice. And so that's you know something to keep in mind. Uh, let's see. Lee says, can you find wintergreen leaves anywhere in West Michigan in the wild? Uh, that's a great question. I, I'm not really from down there. My, I have lived there uh, sometimes when I was a kid, but I don't know. Maybe you guys could uh, speak to that. I found mine in the UP. Um, yeah, that's the ones we use. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so you yeah. might have to do some trading. Yep. Make yeah, a trip up here. Trade that. Allegan Forest? Yeah. All right, Allegan Forest, it's been noted, has them. Okay, cool. So, you get, you got a local source down there. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Norbert says, did you puree the corn? Uh, well, Norbert, I can tell you that I do not puree the corn, but that doesn't mean you couldn't. I don't know if you guys did for this one, but what do you think? You did, you did not. We did not. Yeah. Sorry. Dr. Martin, why is it better to leave the corn whole rather than pureed? Well, it, as far as, you know, my taste, I like to have a little consistency, a little you know, not necessarily a crunch, but something to munch on within there. And it just kind of breaks it up. Otherwise it's like they said, it's a very dense bread. And so it's good to have something else uh, on your tongue, you know? So sometimes it's just about texture, uh, you know, but it also uh, matters what, you know, some people prefer uh, different types of corn, different sweetness. And so that's another thing that you could experiment with. This is just a our favorite version of it, but you should think about your favorite version. And the way you get to that is by experimenting with different types of corn. So maybe someone wants to try a creamy corn or a pureed or, or maybe a more dense corn. And I also wanted to add that uh, with the, the uh, pumpkin cornbread, one of our favorite toppings was cranberry blueberry sauce. Oh. So uh, we made that ourselves with the maple sugar and that was our, our basically our jam to put on top. Yeah, this is the I'm only. I'm not bread. sure that you guys heard that, but there was a groan in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> this that's the only bread right there in front of you guys. That's the only bread we ate the whole year yeah. on the decolonizing diet project. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Back to the. Yeah. Um. So, like, this is another one of those simple, like, uh, simple ways to, like. Uh, for like a sugar craving uh, to satiate that. Um, so what we did is we, we just tossed pecans and maple syrup and then roasted them off for eight minutes uh, and then flipped them another eight minutes. And then um, while they were still warm, we coated them in maple sugar. And so, I mean- A little salt. Yeah, a little salt too. Like it's, 
really good. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> like we've been snacking on it the whole time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is one of the things that um, I make probably every two weeks and I'll make a couple of mason jars and one will stay home, one will go to work and one will disappear. <laughs> so it's really nice to have on hand. Yeah, it's a really great meal. I just add a few words about the salt because some people might say, wait, is salt from the Great Lakes region? You know, is that an indigenous thing? But it is, guys. Uh, we have, uh, an, I don't know how many you guys know down there, but one of the biggest uh, below surface salt mines is actually runs from by Grand Rapids all the way over by Detroit. And you can imagine that there's groundwater and near surface salt mines that were accessed by Anishinaabe Bay in a pre-colonial context. And then don't forget that we also come as Anishinaabe Bay from the East Coast of the United States and Canada, and that we were not unfamiliar with the idea of salt and we certainly had trade routes uh, that brought it in. So there's a number of ways we have salt. My my suggestion is that don't use uh, iodized table salt because it has that anti-caking agent in it, and it's really not good for you anyway. Uh, use try to use those organic salts or uh, like kosher salts when you're doing this stuff. What? I think that I think are you, for, are you guys. Uh, I think no, that wraps no. up our portion, unless okay, there are. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Reinhardt, are there any more questions that we want to address, or do we have questions from our audience here? Oh, here we go. Hold on one yeah, second. Someone. Oh, go ahead. I'll ask mine after. I got one from the sure. Q&A. Yeah, we have, we have a live person here, so we want to take advantage of that. <laughs> so in the cookbook, um, in kind of the intro section, there's an ingredient of grasshopper, but nowhere could I find a recipe <laughs> that used the grasshopper, so I'm curious. Yeah, so um, grasshopper is, you know, it's one of those things that not everybody is going to be brave enough to try. But if you are brave enough, uh, just, you know, the way we prepared it was we caught grasshoppers, which is also a great exercise, by the way. And if you want to involve kids, you know, a grasshopper hunt, that's fun. Uh, we gave, you know, they have those little uh, minnow nets or little butterfly nets. And we had them go out there and catch them with that. And what we did is we would take the grasshoppers back and we would put them uh, in a, a bucket or a container and we put them in the freezer uh, for a little bit and that would cause them to go into a dormant state. And that way, when we put them in the oven, we didn't feel as bad. So it was more of like a moral thing, an ethical thing. And uh, so the other, the other thing we did is after we baked them uh, for a while and we crisped them up, uh, then we, we took them out of the oven, we took the back legs off the back legs of grasshoppers have barbs on them and those don't feel too good when you're uh, chewing them, they get caught in your throat sometimes. So that's a fair warning. And then what we did with the bodies that were crisped, we put them in the grinder and we grinded them up and we made spice out of them. And so that's another indigenous spice and it's also a source of protein. And it's uh, got a little bit of a nutty flavor to it, a grassy flavor. So if you're, if you're not vegetarian, if you don't mind eating, uh, you know, grasshoppers, then try it. It, it goes real good on uh, DDP popcorn and pretty much everything, you know, you can imagine just, again, you have to, you know, experiment with your taste. Okay, so we have one question from the Q&A. Uh, someone says, can you add chili spice? And, you know, this is the thing, folks. If you're trying to be local, like regional, uh, we focused on the decolonizing diet project in the Great Lakes region. And so all of these recipes are really based on the Great Lakes region, which I'm going to talk about pretty soon in the presentation. But you have to determine what indigenous foods you want to eat. What region are you looking at? So like I have students in my classes sometimes. I had one student, uh, you know, she, her family uh, comes from the uh, northern Mexico region, southern, southwestern United States. And she wanted to focus on her family's traditional recipes. And that's fine. If you want to mix recipes, that's fine too. You know, all foods are indigenous from somewhere. But I think it's important to be purposeful and to understand too that there's more to it than just eating indigenous food. It's about saving uh, Mother Earth. And the more local and indigenous we eat, the more healthy it's going to be for our environment. And it's going to provide a, a great future for future generations. 
I think that was a lot of fun in our class when we did have um, a student who did focus on their own um, region of where their family came from and just the experience this person had in discovering flavors and connecting back to home was incredible to see and it was really fun to be a part of. So thinking about where you came from and where your people are is always a good way to start. Yeah, it's really uh, part of, you know, I mean, you think about it, it's part of our identities, right? It's so intimate to reconnect with those, what I think of as the spirit beings that we often think of as food, right? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions from the online chat or the uh, in-person audience? Before, I think we're ready to take a break. I think everybody heard some stomachs growling, so. <laughs> <laughs> So we will take a uh, short break. We're going to take a 15 minute break. For those of you who are watching virtually, you may now go maybe get some food so you're not <laughs> drooling too much during the conversation. And we will um, start up again at uh, eight o'clock with uh, doctors, Dr. Reinhardt's talk. Um, so thank you. And then those of you in the audience, they're going to set up some food here for you to partake of. Uh, you are welcome to sit in here if you would like to sit in um, outside to eat you can also if you go one floor up there's actually an outdoor area if you'd like to eat out there there's a rooftop garden um, hey, hey Tari yeah I, I just want just want to say we're starting back at seven sorry seven yeah okay <laughs> Wait, my watch. Yes, thank you. Okay. I, I had some of my husband back there in the audience telling, giving me the seven sign. I'm going, what's that mean? <laughs> thank you, Dr. Reinhardt <laughs> and Steve. Um, so yes, we'll start back up at seven o'clock. Thank you. Well, buju, wabinang meshe kya kya dijnakas, and bawating don jiba, ajijak and dodam, and the shnabe ojibwe in the ao, kiche na mebene zibing and dading. And my name is Marty Reinhardt in English. Uh, my family is Anishinaabe Ojibwe, we're Crane Clan. And my family comes from the Bawating or Plates of the Rapids uh, on this side of the US Canadian border and also Kitagan Zibing on the, or Garden River First Nation on the Canadian side of the international border. And I am here with my wife, Tina, who's gonna introduce herself. Ani, from up to my Narawakwe Neashe Ndonjwa and Michigan to them. My uh, English name is Tina Moses. Uh, my uh, uh, Ojibwe name is uh, Running Wolf Woman, and that was given to me by my uncle. And uh, that's uh, a name that I, I carry very um, strongly following it. Uh, let's see here. I'm, I introduced myself and where I was from. I grew up in St. Agnes. And so when I was over there, um, I always knew that area as Michelamackinac, or pronouncing it the English way, Michelamackinac. Mm -hmm. And so there's uh, little variations in some of the words that we, that we know in Michigan, and uh, they're actually mispronounced Ojibwe words. I also said that I was uh, from the Turtle Clan. That's what my family. Yeah, the Nada Wekwe Neashe, that mm -hmm. uh, means that uh, Iroquois uh, woman point. So at some point in time, you might guess that uh, this Iroquois woman who came there or appeared there must have been a very powerful being uh, for that, uh, that place to be called that. So I just want to call your attention to the uh, image on the cover slide you know uh, that is a wild rice camp there's a lot going on in that and that's one of the historical photos uh, from one of the wild rice camps over i think it's like the flambeau in minnesota and if you see in the foreground there you have this woman who is this is obviously a transition uh era image because it's a uh, a metal uh uh, container there that she's parching the rice in. You can see the smoke coming off. And so that you gotta be real careful when you're processing wild rice uh, that you don't burn it. Uh, then you see that little baby and that Tikanagan there and little Benoji. 
and the baby has got its hands and its feet, you know, they're bound inside. And you can just imagine being that little baby and just smelling and hearing and feeling all of the things that are going on around them or her in that, uh, in this camp, right next to the baby, between the woman and the baby, there is this uh, basket and uh, that basket is full of wild rice, manomen. And then you can see just behind that basket, there's these young people. I imagine they're the children and they are winnowing. They're winnowing the wild rice. They're, uh, that's that kind of cloud. That's why it's a little bit cloudy in front of them. Uh, that's the, the husk coming off of the wild rice and blowing away in the wind there. And then to their left, you see there's a guy. He looks like he's uh, down in a pit. That's because he actually is. He is uh, doing what we call jigging the wild rice. He's dancing it. And uh, that's how that wild rice, uh, once it's been parched, it, the, uh, the uh, husk is taken off of the, the wild rice before it's winnowed. So there's so much going on in here. And then if you look in the way background there, you know, it kind of looks like a, a lake. And that might just be the lake that they got that wild rice from. So it's a really cool uh, historic image that I, I like to use for this. And of course, you know, the, uh, it's called spirit food, you know, and when I think of spirit food, I think about all those spirit beings that we think of as food, you know, those plants and animals, those things that come from our mother, the earth. The decolonizing diet project it was approved by the Institutional Review Board from Northern Michigan University. And it's an exploratory study of the relationships between people and indigenous foods of the Great Lakes region. So like I said before, you know, we focused on this region and we focused on multiple dimensions for our study. We wanted to make sure that we looked at it from a, not just a biological, but also from a cultural and legal and political lens. The image on this slide, this is my mother's father's family. So my maternal grandfather's family, the Bureau uh, from Kiriganzi Bing, uh, Garden River First Nation in Ontario. And that's a sugar bush. Uh, that's our family sugar bush. It's one of those historical photos. And so it's, uh, it's it, I'm proud of that. You know, I'm proud to have this historical photo that shows uh, this family tradition from my own family, uh, much like that wild rice tradition for that other family that I showed on the title slide. The goals for the DDP was to connect or reconnect, depending on the circumstances, humans with foods that are indigenous to the Great Lakes region that, you know, they were part of our diets prior to colonization, and we want to connect with them and make them part of our diet again. And also to provide uh, data. I made a joke about the uh, data earlier before this uh, thing started tonight, but providing uh, data for uh, tribal communities and others that are working toward revitalization of indigenous cultures because you know food sovereignty has to be core uh, to the revitalization process i like the image on this one too it's a uh, painting a, on a it's a pictograph on the side of the agua canyon there and it shows these human forms with the moose and the other animals you know sky creatures and land creatures but it it's a message is what it is it's a message from our ancestors to us the people who are seeing it now and we it's up to us to interpret it it's up to us to understand it within the context uh, that it was painted and what is the meaning for us today i have to assume that that's about the sacredness of life every time you think about our relationship with those other spirit beings so we defined the Great Lakes region in three different ways. Uh, one way is we talked about the tributaries uh, that feed the Great Lakes region or that they feed. And so that's one way we did that. We also looked at Helen Hornbeck Tanner's Atlas of Great Lakes Indian History, where she defines the principal cultural theater of interactions between different uh, tribal cultural groups in a region. And so that's another definition that we used. And then the last definition that we used is a vernacular definition. We, in other words, we asked people, do you consider yourselves living within the Great Lakes region? And depending on the answers that we got, we adjusted the lines of the region. Uh, so you can see that the lines uh, completely cover the states of Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. 
and then parts of Pennsylvania and New York. It follows the height of land uh, through the Appalachian Mountain region, and then through Ontario on the north, uh, north shore of Lake Huron, Lake Superior. It also follows the height of land over to Rainy Lake and Lake of the Woods, uh, across the Mississippi headwaters, uh, through parts of Minnesota, uh, covering White Earth, all the way down uh, just west of the Mississippi River to the uh, confluence of the Mississippi, the Wabash, and the Ohio. So there's a lot of food diversity, as you can imagine, within that region. And the last cool thing about this map is it kind of looks like a bear's head when you look at it from the left to the right, an unintended consequence. We had uh, 25 voluntary research participants. I try to call them participants more than subjects, get away from that laboratory terminology. But, you know, and that's really what it was. These folks were volunteers and they wanted to be part of this. And, you know, it was really fun. We had staff, uh, very limited staff, but we uh, drew on the staff from the Center for Native American Studies. And we had a number of volunteers. We didn't have much money to do this. We had hoped for hundreds of thousands of dollars to support the study when we uh, were thinking about it. Uh, but we really didn't have much money. I think we had, what, $13,000 for the entire year. And uh, we uh, looked uh, to the Great uh, Lakes uh, Indian Wildlife Federation, or I'm sorry, Commission, uh, for advising, and also uh, looked to Devin Maihisua uh, as an advisor uh, from the American Indian Health and Diet Project uh, that she uh, was had created and maintains. We also had a number of people from the NMU community that supported us, uh, whether that was other professors or students, and then just folks from the Great Lakes region uh, out there in the community, elders and community members who, you know, sometimes we just call them up and say, hey, you got any food, <laughs> indigenous foods that we can get from you? Uh, sometimes people would call us and say, hey, you know, I got some venison. Um, so you know, there's a number of others too, who I probably have missed in that list. But those are some images uh, from the uh, different groups that were part of uh, what we did that year. Uh, amazing, amazing group. So on an individual commitment uh, to this, we had people who had to commit between 25 to 100% of their daily diet that consisted of indigenous foods from the Great Lakes region. Uh, we also said, you know what, you should probably, if you're going to commit at 25%, you should plan to eat at 50%. So we, you know, we wanted to make sure that people could stay above their commitment level and to be prepared for that. Uh, we didn't want them to commit at 25% and then for some reason drop below 25%. So we always encouraged folks to eat higher than their commitment level. Obviously with 100 percenters, uh, we couldn't do that. I was one of the 100 percenters and there was only one other 100 percenter. Everyone else was between 25 and 99 percent. And so that uh, some of the 99 percenters were like, well, I can't live without coffee or chocolate or uh, chilies. You know, someone had a comment about chilies earlier. So that's one of the uh, things that we required. We also, asked people to adhere, adhere to an exercise regimen that they worked out with their physicians uh, to increase their physical activity on a daily basis and to do that with a physician of their choosing, whether that was someone that they uh, knew from their community, the Indian Health Services, or if they had a private doctor uh, to do that with them. And we also uh, did that for one year. It was a one-year plan, although we, um, you know, the year uh, was short for some folks because they opted out uh, up to the six month mark. And then we had some folks who opted in at the six month mark. So it was more like a half a year for those folks, but we needed at least half a year uh, to have uh, usable data. But we had uh, quite a few folks who maintained the whole year. We used multiple forms of media to record our experiences, including journals, written journals online, uh, photos and video or audio recordings. And then everyone had to commit to getting an annual physical before and after, and then regularly quarterly health checks uh, during that time. So we began planning and doing some research, <clears throat> excuse me, in November of 2010. 
And then uh, we had our implementation phase, our year began in spring of 2012 and ran to 2013. Uh, from 2013 to 2014, we did our analysis and reporting phase of the results. And of course, there's uh, going to be offshoots, which I'll talk about later in the presentation. But the, uh, let me talk just a little bit about the research. You know, we had thought that we might be able to kick this off in 2011. Uh, but when we started doing the research and we've seen what an enormous task it was just researching the foods and the you know, thinking that we're going to have to carry 25 individuals along with us. It's not just a, myself or me and Tina. Uh, then we, you know, we had to stop and, you know, take a, a step back and say, okay, well, we've got to do this the right way if we're going to do this. And so that's what we decided. We were going to take another year, do a better preparation. And so we thought, okay, in the spring of 2012, uh, we're going to, to do this. And we thought we were going to have a little bit longer to do that. I don't know if you guys remember the spring of 2012, but it was a hot, uh, it was a well, it was warm uh, spring that came early. And so we were going to kick it off when the, the sap started to run. Uh, but when it started to run in February, we weren't prepared. We still had a few things, loose ends to tie up. So we actually chose a start date in March. And so we went from March 25th, 2012, and we ended on March 24th of 2013. And what a great year it was. We believe that there are two primary ways that indigenous foods are defined. And one is in relationship to themselves. And, you know, these foods, they knew each other before humans knew them. You know, we're taught as Anishinaabe that the plants and animals were here before us. They're the older, wiser beings, as Dan Wildcat would call them. And then, you know, there's the relationship that we have with them as humans, as indigenous people, indigenous humans. And those relationships may be very deep and historical, uh, shared spiritual connections that we have with them. Uh, some of those in, are intact. Some of them have been disrupted uh, for no fault of our own through reservationalization, uh, relo removal and relocation, uh, boarding school experiences and assimilation. Uh, termination. I mean, you know, a lot of the shuns uh, disrupted our uh, relationship with these uh, plants and animal relatives. We researched over 500 uh, different foods that is still available in our master list of DDP eligible foods. If you go to our group site, which I'll show you the uh, links to later on in the presentation, but it includes plants, mammals, birds, fish, fungi, insects, amphibians, reptiles, mussels, and other forms of food. And we put this list together with the scientific names, the common names, and where we could uh, find them. We also included Anishinaabe names. And, you know, this is not a concrete list. This is an organic list. So we may, from time to time, add uh, other ones to it as we understand the foods. Uh, we tried not to include things that were more medicinals, uh, that were more edibles. And so sometimes the line gets a little blurred between medicinals and edibles, and we understand that. So, you know, sometimes we can be convinced to add something or take something off of the list. So if there's ever a thing that you see in here that shouldn't be in here, let me know. You know, or if you think that there's something that I don't have on the list, it could have been an oversight or maybe we had already taken it off and you know, uh, because someone else argued that it shouldn't be on there. So anyway, it's an organic list, and uh, we fully anticipate that it will remain that way as we continue to work in this important area of food. One of Tina's least favorite uh, slides of this presentation, which I've tried to, you know, make it better, but it's the uh, DDP food criteria table. And this is how we did, uh, how we determined if we were going to include foods or not. Uh, those things that we considered eligible were from our master food list, and they had to be native pre-colonials, which means foods that were not introduced by humans deliberately or accidentally into the Great Lakes region uh, prior to European colonization. And examples like, uh, one of the examples that you guys are uh, tasting there this evening is the wintergreen. Or what is it that uh, Mariah called it? The uh, gum, gum tea. <laughs> That's pretty cool. 
and so uh, the order of mallard ducks uh, introduced pre-colonials, introduced pre-colonials are foods that were introduced to the Great Lakes region by humans prior to colonization. So our Anishinaabe ancestors and other uh, indigenous peoples who were here uh, prior to colonization um, and the foods that they brought with them. So three of those you guys are very familiar with, the corn, beans, and squash, uh, the three sisters. And so those were human introduced into the Great Lakes region. They were not here uh, naturally by themselves without humans bringing them here. We also have the native pre-colonial derivations. Uh, these were foods or, or uh, varieties of foods that uh, derived from the original native pre-colonials. And for example, I talked about the mallard duck as a native pre-colonial. And then humans actually adapted what's known as the peckin duck from mallards. And so peckin ducks, the Aflac commercial duck, Aflac, you know, that's an example of a, a derivation. Uh, so imagine like the duck eggs that you guys are eating in your uh, pumpkin cornbread this evening are probably from peckin ducks. The, these are mallards that have been domesticated. Introduced pre-colonial derivations are the foods that are derived from the human introduced foods into the Great Lakes region. And so like with the corn, we now have super sweet hybrid corn, you know, so the again, the sweet corns that you're eating this evening as part of the uh, the pumpkin cornbread is an, another example of a derived uh, food from the original corns that were introduced way back when in the Great Lakes region. Some of the foods that were not included in the DDP are foods that were introduced colon, uh, in a colonial context. So after colonization began, and we measure that from the year 1602 or 1600, we just called it, uh, forward into the Great Lakes region. That is as far back as we can tell that uh, foods were introduced in the Great Lakes region as uh, after colonization. And so anything that was not here uh, that was introduced in a colonial context, we did not include that. Examples include pig, uh, oats, and other foods that are not from this area. Introduced colonial derivations are foods that were derived from those introduced colonial foods, but are not GMOs. And then lastly, we did not include any GMO products, genetically modified organisms uh, that could have been deliberately modified from any of the previous categories, whether that's native foods or colonial foods. And so that's the way we determined what we were going to eat or not for that year. Here's an example of a genetically modified corn. You know, this is actually, uh, some of you guys may have seen this on Facebook. I know it's made its way around, but this is the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Pesticide Programs, Biopesticides and Pollution, that they list Monsanto's, uh, what do they call it even? They say it's uh, uh, Mon89034, whatever, 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 Complete insect Insect-Protected Herbicide-Tolerant Corn. That is not something that we ate on the DDP, nor will I ever eat again. So don't eat genetically modified, complete insect protected herbicide tolerant corn, please. That doesn't even sound good. So how did people uh, get their foods? How did they know what to eat? How did we help them do that? We help people hunt, fish, gather, forage, garden, purchase, trade, share, and combinations thereof. Uh, that Wawash Keshi right there, uh, hanging from the uh, rafters in our house, uh, that was the first deer that I ever took in my life. And it was really a special time because it was during the decolonizing diet project. And don't get me wrong, folks, I had been out hunting years before. I always went out hunting with my dad or my cousins or my uncles, and I'd never gotten my own deer. And this this was this uh, spike horn here. Uh, I got it on our land, and it was just you know it was like it was time. It was a special time during the DDP, and uh, unfortunately my dad passed on uh, before this time. Uh, but when I was out there, I you know I, I thought how proud he would be of what we were doing. 
the image right next to it is us going out foraging on one of the uh, DDPers, one of the research participants land. Uh, that's actually the day we uh, went out and got grasshoppers. And I think I might have a photo of that grasshopper stuff too. And then uh, down there, that's Tina and I, we're out on Lac View Desert and we're wild ricing. I'm pushing with the push pole and Tina's got the, the rice knockers there. And uh, yeah, that was a good time. How did we know how to prepare the foods once we got them? Uh, well, you know, it was a lot of experimentation. We did cooking demos once we figured out good ways to prepare them. We would teach other people. And we also had potlucks, some of the potlucks at the beginning of the year. The food was very bland. It was like a lot of singular things. People would bring just like blueberries with nothing or raspberries or, you know, just even pumpkin seeds, you know, uncooked raw seeds and stuff. And so it was very basic. And it was very bland, and uh, but we we enjoyed it. You know, it was something that we were just starting to learn about ourselves. And so, you know, uh, some people would even bring stuff that had non uh, DDP eligible foods. And of course, before we ate at these potlucks, we would always ask you know people to present their foods and to explain you know how it was DDP eligible. And sometimes it wasn't. And so, as hundred percenters, we didn't eat those that were not hundred percent, but everyone else got to. And eventually, uh, people got better at it. You know, they got better at not including uh, the non-DDP eligible foods, so that 100%ers uh, could eat it as well. We also kept an online our online journals, which had the food in it, and a recipe forum. Uh, the Decolonizing Diet Project Cookbook that you all have a copy of this evening is actually a result of those online journals and the recipe forum. Tina, if you want to jump in anytime, just, just do that because I'm just going to keep rolling through. So uh, now we're just going to talk about the, the outcomes. And again, it's along the lines of the biological, cultural, and the legal, political, um, different dimensions that we looked at as a result of the DDP. So some of the most common foods we ate uh, during that year, of course, wild rice was among the top ones. Uh, corn products, maple products. I am a mapleaholic, and uh, sunflower. We use a lot of sunflower oil. We ate so much sunflower oil and sunflower shoots that Tina got real tired of eating sunflowers. Uh, a lot of pumpkin products, uh, or and or squash, including chigete kosaman, uh, the really ancient uh, Nishinabe squash. I think it's probably beyond Anishinaabe as well. Uh, lots of berries. You know, uh, indigenous berries, uh, wild leeks or ramps, uh, lots of beans. You know, some of those beans, in fact, that come from the uh, uh, Kamad Food Program, those great northern beans are indigenous uh, beans that were here in this area. And so we found a good use for them besides making hacky sacks or storing them in your grandma's closet. Uh, sweet potatoes, lots of sweet potatoes. Uh, of course, you know, like the pecans that you guys are eating this evening, that was one of our number one snacks. Turkey, oh my gosh, we ate a lot of turkey. And uh, the sunchokes, you know, we uh, made the inulin powder from the sunchokes, we grew those. Uh, we also ate them, kind of like uh, potatoes, but let me tell you folks, don't eat too many sunchokes, especially raw, because they will give you gas. Your stomach will bloat. Uh, we ate a lot of venison uh, when we had it. Uh, I got five uh, deer that year, uh, and we shared it with a lot of the other DDPers. And we ate a lot of bison. Uh, mostly ground bison. Bison's pretty pricey, so if you get ground bison, it's it's uh, much uh, more cheap than the uh, steaks or the roast. But boy, did we enjoy the roast too! And a lot of fish, indigenous fish. The most popular fish was uh, white fish, uh, perch, and walleye. Here are some of the le uh, more unusual things we ate that year. Uh, you picked up on this earlier. The uh, grasshopper. That's my nephew there. Uh, who uh, went out grasshopper hunting with us and we made the grasshopper. Uh, the middle image right there, that's white pine bark. Uh, you strip that and you eat the, uh, the inner part of the bark. And we did that in multiple ways. We fried it, uh, we boiled it, and uh, you know, it has the textures, it's woody, it's stringy. Uh, it tastes like pine, uh, but you can also make flour out of it. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not necessarily something I would eat daily, to be honest, 
uh, but it's definitely something that I would uh, be able to eat to survive. And I think when you put it in flour, it has a unique taste. So the uh, crab apples, you know, there's one uh, apple that's indigenous to the Great Lakes region, and that's the American sweet crab apple. And that is what we were, is in the image on the right there. We made our own crab apple sauce from crab apples that we gathered. And uh, we also made the uh, crab apple cider vinegar and or the uh, crab apple cider itself. Uh, we also ate squirrel and porcupine. And uh, I'm not sure how many of you guys have ever had squirrel or porcupine. But they're a little bit greasy. Uh, you got to you know, prepare them uh, just right. Uh, one of the ways we like to prepare them is with the crab apples and cranberries. It takes a little bit of the gamey taste away, if, unless you like the gamey taste. Some people do. So here's a list of the uh, frequencies from my uh, three-month food frequency chart. And I split that up into breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snack. Uh, you can see the uh, how many times I had these things uh, during that three-month period. Uh, 224 times I had corn. 153 times I had duck eggs. But look at that. 393 times I had something maple in three months. I told you guys I'm a mapleaholic. Uh, sea salt, I also like uh, not just the sweet, but the salty, 237 times. And there you can see wild rice played a big part in my diet, 223 times. So we are happy to be able to report that on a biological level, we did a statistical analysis of our group aggregate data, and we now can report that we had significant, this is statistically significant reductions in weight and girth and BMI. And so statistical significance is important for us to be able to say that. Uh, and we've now had uh, folks who are looking uh, at Indigenous diets uh, from medical schools and medical journals have uh, seen our outcomes and they're very interested and have been uh, talking with us about that. So that's on an aggregate level. Uh, but this is also, uh, these outcomes, uh, we also asked one of the biology uh, instructors to help us with this. Mm -hmm. So this wasn't just us, you know, looking at data and you know, coming up with this on ourselves. Yeah, we actually had someone who knew what they were doing, because <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll tell you right now, I am mm -hmm. not a statistician. So it was good to get that that uh, support. Uh, we also had individuals, uh, who, you know, beyond the group data, we had individuals who were part of our group who experienced either noteworthy, which is not statistically significant, but it's still important data, and or significant, again, statistically significant reductions in blood pressure, cholesterol, and that's bad cholesterol, by the way the triglycerides and LDL, and reductions in blood glucose levels. So that's really important for us to be able to report this because I'll tell you folks, in Indian country, obesity, heart disease, and diabetes are three of the primary killers of Indian people. And so for us to be able to report these things is very important uh, for us to consider as we move forward in uh, addressing health issues in our communities. Here is the group uh, aggregate data in table form, and I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not, but anyway, in the change base to end column, which is more in the right of the middle, you can see there are uh, four things that have asterisks next to them. Uh, those are our significant findings, and that is weight, BMI, waist, and hip, or girth. In the base to average, you also see over on the far right, there's five uh, different measures, and the one that adds to that is blood pressure. So that's our significant findings, uh, base to end and base to average. So as far as, uh, you know, here's my case study at 100% commitment level. You can see the differences in uh, my uh, baseline to the average. And you can see, so this is one way to measure it. So for my systolic blood pressure up top, you see that there was a decrease in 12.5 over on the far right there. And as you go down, my diastolic, uh, negative 11.3. Look at though my weight. I lost 26.5 pounds uh, during, or based on the baseline to interval average. And then my BMI is a negative 3.8. 
my waist measurement went down 8.1 centimeters. I had to start tightening my belt, literally. I did not get hip measurements. Hip measurements, uh, the physicians usually use those for females. And then my cholesterol was down negative 48, as well as my triglycerides. That is really important. So as far as bad cholesterol, down negative 48, that's huge. Uh, LDL, again, bad, the negative 37.8, good. HDL, kind of plateaued, that's good cholesterol at 3.8, uh, negative 3.8 for myself. Here's my table, here's the same data in a table. Uh, for me, you can see the different uh, stair steps uh, down the cholesterol and triglycerides, LDL, way down. One thing you'll see on this table, though, is my glucose, my blood glucose level uh, is pretty much plateaued. And I'll show you why that is in this next slide here. Because I'm a mapleaholic, I've told you guys. All right, so I got my baseline. You can see I went up, I went down, I went up, and then I went way up. Well, that interval four was the last quarter of the DDP implementation year. It was also winter time. And one of the things that you guys know about food is sometimes we use food as comfort food. And there's also this thing called uh, vasodilation. Uh, so between vasodilation and comfort food and me being a mapleaholic, I blame those three factors for interval four. No apologies, I like maple. On a sociocultural outcomes level, uh, we know that family and community support are very significant for the success of these diets. Uh, this is something that was common in other uh, projects that we've read about and certainly was major importance to this one. Tina and I had to transform a lot of the space in our house to accommodate our DDP needs. Uh, we literally had to get new shelves, uh, had to make room in our freezer, the dry goods, the refrigerator, and we still had our daughters uh, who were eating food at our house and we had to accommodate their non-DDP needs. So we had a lot of food at our house, which was really cool, uh, but we also had to make space. The time commitment was a major source of anxiety for folks who were uh, part of the DDP. Uh, we were asking a lot of them. We asked them to, one, eat indigenous foods, but we also asked them to go to the doctor on a regular basis, to do exercise. And on top of all that, we asked them to every day write in their journal. And then if they were, you know, on top of that, like going out hunting, fishing, gathering, gardening, they had to process all that stuff. And so time uh, commitment was meaning less sleep for folks and not doing some stuff that they were used to doing because they were committed to the DDP. It's not, uh, it's not an easy life. It's a really healthy life, but compared to the uh, current schedule that many of us keep in our lives, uh, we had to shift. We did have a small impact on the local markets here. Uh, we had a large impact for certain businesses, however, like the Marquette Food Co-op, they began labeling their stuff as DDP eligible. And we even like some of the things that we have carried forward now, we had scavenger hunt that they do on an annual basis as part of the uh, Native American month. We have a week of eating indigenous foods and they, they do that uh, to support that. We also had Phil's Fish House here locally who uh, we asked them if they would smoke uh, their fish that they were smoking for us, just using indigenous products, and they were glad to uh, uh, do that for us. Price and convenience are by far the major limiting factors uh, for indigenous diets. Uh, this is proven time and time again in the different studies. Uh, the cheaper it is, the more likely people are to eat it. Uh, families uh, that don't have a lot of money that can make use of commodity foods, uh, you know, for families that get commodity foods, and or for families that are very uh, limited in what they can spend at the marketplace. Uh, you know, price is going to drive that. Convenience though is also another factor. Uh, the more convenient it was for people to get it, the more they ate it. So if they had to go hunt or hunt it or fish it or garden it, the less they were uh, going to eat it. If they could get it in the marketplace for cheap, that's the main way that they found indigenous foods. Uh, we started out with 10, native research subjects and 15 non-native research subjects. By the end of the implementation phase year, there were 12 native and seven non-native. Uh, we had some people who got hungry and ate the other ones. 
Just kidding. We didn't do that. Uh, again, this this is because of the opt-in, opt-out up to the six-month uh, uh, part of the, the diet year. I thought I always think this is an interesting one, the DDP guilt. So this uh, guilt that results from commitment level or failing to, you know, writing journals or the inability to share food, uh, sometimes in our dreams, our cravings. This is from Nancy Irish, uh, one of our elder uh, non-native uh, DDPers. Uh, I've lost too many hours of sleep over DDP guilt, not to ignore it any longer. My version of DDP guilt isn't about my diet commitment, which I've kept, but about logging it. I'm disappointed in myself for not keeping that part of the deal, but there it is, here I am, and here I go with what I'm hoping will be a strong finish. Uh, she did that in November of 2012. You know, one of my uh, DDP guilts uh, resulted from dreaming. I was a hundred percenter and I would dream about eating non-DDP foods and I'd wake up and I'd be like, oh, thank goodness I didn't mess it all up. Uh, we had some social groups, including the 200 percenters, the less than 100 percenters, the original DDPers, the replacement DDPers, the staff, the volunteers, then the families and the friends. And so there was a lot of people. I mean, Cam himself, this evening you heard Cam uh, talk about he was uh, doing the DDP on his own. And so, you know, there are many kinds of social groups that this uh, project has impacted and continues to impact today. Tina and I were just talking about how DDP has a life of its own now. It's kind of like a kid, you know, when it gets to be a certain age, it, it gets out there and does its own thing. And that's kind of the way we feel about the DDP. It's now it's kind of doing its own thing without us. We don't even know sometimes that people are doing things that are DDP related, but it's cool to hear about them. Uh, my coworker and friend, April Lindela, conducted a microethnographic sub-study of female perspectives on the DDP. And one of the things that she found was that there are, in fact, societal expectations for males to hunt and fish among the DDPers, or there were, and that community and connection were actually more important for female research subjects than they were for males. Uh, there tended to be this more cavalier attitude. Uh, by the end of the uh, DDP implementation year, however, those uh, expectations had shifted to where there was matched expectations for both male and female to do all parts of the, uh, the DDP. On a legal and political level, uh, treaty rights and boundaries made a big difference in access to foods between Native and non-Native and between different Native uh, people in their tribes. Uh, you can see the map there on the right. That is the uh, land session treaty boundaries for the state of Michigan and Marquette, Michigan, where Northern Michigan University exists and acted as the epicenter of the decolonizing diet project. Uh, that has both the uh, 1836 uh, treaty ceded territory and the 1842 uh, ceded territory. And so we were right on the both uh, verge of, or the uh, border of both. Uh, Tina and I are 1836 treaty hunters and fishers and gatherers. And then we have friends on the DDP who are 1842. And then we had native people who are actually uh, from Canadian First Nations who did not have the same uh, treaty rights arguably. Uh, as we did. And then, of course, we had the non-Native who have their own treaty rights, which are the treaty rights that they have to be considered residents of the state of Michigan, who hunt under Michigan uh, laws and policies. We also had policies like on campus here that limited our interactions, what we were kind of disappointed about. There was limited parking, for instance, uh, for our DDP events. Uh, we were told that there was limited access for non-NMU community members who needed access to our website so they could keep their journal. Uh, we weren't even allowed to have potlucks on campus for a food study because of safety concerns. So what did we do? We walked across the street to the basement of a church and had our potluck there. Uh, and I admit it, I admit it folks, I smuggled food and drinks into restaurants and the movie theater. I'm guilty. Uh, I was not going to not have my social interactions, and often social interactions involve food and drinks. So that's what I did. We had some really cool times uh, as part of the DDP. We had our Indigenous Foods Cook-Off, which was one of my, I think, in fact, this probably was my favorite event. Probably uh, everyone's favorite. I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had three teams. We had the Elderberries, Nishin Mijin, which means good food, and Mazed and Confused, a little reference to Led Zeppelin there. 
And uh, the teams made their own names, by the way. These were not uh, conferred upon them. Uh, they picked them themselves. Uh, we did, pro however, provide all the teams with uh, mystery ingredients. And we gave them five hours to prepare an entree, a side, and a dessert. And they were judged by professional food tasters and audience members. And it was so cool. I love this uh, event. And here are some images of the foods that they created. I mean, look at, it looks gourmet, right? I mean, this was the toward the end of the DDP. Before the cookbook. Before the cookbook. And my goodness, I mean, look at that. And the square bowls over there, that's duck egg drop soup with the uh, different uh, DDP spices. Uh, we have the, uh, um, let's see, that's the okay. cookies, pecan. that pecan, and, uh, pecan, uh, sun, it was a sun butter, yeah. raspberry cookies. Oh my gosh, it was so good. And you know, it, the the judges are there in the middle. These are actually uh, the person on the right is or left is Chris Kibbett, who is actually a chef here in culinary arts at uh, Northern Michigan University. He's also a professional uh, taste tester. And then the other two are uh, also professional taste testers from the local community. And the one in the middle is uh, Moe Mwafi, who's also uh, a professor here on campus, or was, in uh, exercise science. We had a DDP end of the year celebration, a final feast that was made by the DDP staff and volunteers for the DDPers. And then uh, my uncle and April and I, we provided music uh, for the event. And then we did a presentation on the preliminary outcomes of the DDP. And then we had, a, which made me almost cry, in fact, I think I did tear up during the story by Nancy, Karen, and Andrew. It was like this epic uh, story uh, essay about their experiences on the DDP. And then everything that we had left over, seeds, food, you know, dried foods, whatever, we gave it all away to the, all the DDPers, the people who uh, participated and volunteered. It was a great end of the year celebration. Uh, we have some extensions that, uh, from the DDP, presentations, demonstrations, invited chapters, the cookbook, gardens, camps foraging, you name it. Uh, it was just a lot of, lot of extensions from the, the DDP. My daughter, uh, Nim, my older daughter, who is now a family nurse practitioner, I'm very proud of her. We are very proud of her. Yes, yeah. uh, she did a three-year follow-up study uh, to the DDP. And one of the things that she found is that the, as the people got further away from the DDP year, their uh, good outcomes on a biological level started to fade. And that we kind of would expect that, right? If the eating the foods and uh, the commitment level to the diet is not something that you're following anymore, uh, we would have expected that it would uh, see some return to uh, worse outcomes of their biological checks. And so you can see that the purple, you know, it's gone back up and in some cases with a vengeance and on a group level. So that's unfortunate mm -hmm. on a biological level, but uh, we still know that in an individual level, some people are certainly still following uh, a level of commitment. Maybe not the level they had that year, but at least a level. Uh, as far as survey outcomes, 100% of the DDPers reported that they were continuing to consume some DDP foods on a daily basis. 33% uh, of the DDPers reported that they no longer required medications that they were on before the DDP. And that was pretty cool. 56% uh, reported including DDP foods in 25 to 49% of their daily diet. So you can see that there's at least some, uh, almost a little over half of the folks were continuing to do that. Tina and I tried to incorporate 25 or, or percent more of our, boy, I'm getting tired, I must be, 25% or more on a daily basis. 78% uh, eat at home uh, cooked meals, 89% report learning about indigenous foods uh, from their experience with the DDP. That's where they learned about it. And between 56 to 89 accessed the foods through growing them or foraging them. 44% exercise on a daily basis. 78% now drink tea, white pine and wintergreen, which you guys had this evening as a daily beverage. Uh, the research subjects tended to show significant decrease in positive outcomes the further they drifted away from the DDP foods. Uh, they all said that they retained the lessons, but they still drifted away from the foods, most likely due to price and convenience. Uh, what we found on the DDP, she found in the three-year follow-up study. Um, and then lastly, there, the biggest difference 
uh, may have been that they were not committed to the diet after the implementation phase, so they re reverted back to previous habits. Here are some links uh, to the DDP websites. The Facebook site has now over 5,000 members. If you're not part of our Facebook site, uh, please do join us. It's a large, large group. I think it's one of the largest uh, Facebook sites that's dedicated to indigenous foods. Uh, we also have the group site there where you can still download the share group uh, data for the uh, eligible food list. And then our Flickr site, uh, which has a lot of the photos from our, our DDP implementation phase year. Make sure uh, if you do uh, have any interest in using any of the photos from the Flickr site, uh, Tina, a lot of those photos she mm -hmm. took. So please do ask permission before you use those. Uh, some Spinoffs from the DDP include a treaty food provision study uh, in which I found that 295 of the treaties written between the United States and American Indian tribes include uh, provisions for food. Uh, this is one of my favorite images of all time uh, that has something to do with uh, treaties. This is a 1849 treaty petition carried from the Lake Superior Ojibwe all the way to Washington, D.C. and handed to the U.S. president to explain our relationship uh, between ourselves and uh, the world that we come from, uh, the plants and the animals and our relationship with Mother Earth. Uh, those are spirit lines between the eyes of the crane clan being on the right and the eyes of the other clan beings or dotum beings uh, behind the crane and also uh, spirit lines from the heart of the crane to the other hearts of the uh, other beings and then that line going off the off the page to the right that's the line that's going to the president of the united states very cool uh, image we did a uh, study on traditional ecological knowledge uh, in the great lakes region i'm going to let tina tell you about some of the things that we did during that year so this was a spinoff of the decolonizing diet project and because uh, we wanted to find out from other people what kind of indigenous foods they they um, they use that they uh, cultivate and we wanted to travel to these other places and um, interview them and learn from them about what they do so in this picture here it these, this is corn and each jar that you see is a different species of corn and this is only two of the walls you know you you walk into this room and it's it's climate um, controlled climate controlled but all four walls are just loaded with different corn uh yeah they estimated that this corn uh the varieties that exist in here these are all indigenous corns mm -hmm. that that was about two-thirds only two-thirds of the indigenous corns that exist and one of the things we learned while we were um, talking with these folks is that these um, seeds, they're not meant to be kept in jars or in that that big vault that is uh, Svelteward. Svelteward. Um What they do is they will take some of these seeds out, uh, random seeds out and pass them to people to grow them. And then they will replenish it a um, couple of reasons why they do this when the seeds are left inside the jar they're they're not being climatized so if you see um seal it up and you never use it it's not going to be adapted to whatever the environment um has wherever you're planting it another thing is that what if there's a drought in one area uh, they would pass seeds to different communities and ask them to grow them for them and then share what they grew so it's a matter of food security. Food security, yep. The last study uh, spinoff that I'm currently working on right now is called the Great Lakes Materials, Indigenous Materials Poop Study or GLIMPS. And yep, you heard it, poop. Uh, so, you know, the purpose of GLIMPS is to contribute knowledge uh, about our indigenous methods and materials for pooping. What goes in your mouth comes out the other end, so it makes sense. And it's something that, uh, you know, uh, Frank, Kevin, Finney, and I have been talking about this for, for years as we meet up at the Indigenous Farming Conference or other or conferences. And we always have this, this question of, well, what was it? How did we deal with our poop? And, you know, it's really cool to read all the uh, research articles that we've read now about it and to actually interview a couple folks. 
uh, about their perspectives on it, to recall my own family teachings about it uh, when I was a kid from my grandmother, and lastly, to experiment. And so that picture right there, that's Tina and I setting up my poop field. Uh, I actually will uh, have been going out uh, to this area and pooping using different indigenous materials for hygiene purposes. And so I'm recording all of that uh, in uh, my my study. He is not actually recording himself pooping. <laughs> he is recording what he has done. He's writing it yeah, down. So no no photos of poop <laughs> no. or my bare bottom. So. <laughs> uh, we have two DDP publications that are available. Uh, one you guys have in your hands, the Decolonizing Diet Project cookbook. And the other one is a more of an academic, uh, which is kind of goes along the same lines as this presentation this evening. And that's called Spirit Food, a Multidimensional Overview of the Decolonizing Diet Project. It's in Indigenous Innovation, Universalities, and Peculiarities, which even the title of the book is a bit peculiar. But anyway, that's uh, where you'll find a chapter if you're looking for an academic version of this. We will have another upcoming publication that's going to be published through the Minnesota Historical Society. Uh, we're going, we've are going. we been working uh, with Christy Belcourt to provide some of the cover uh, images, which I love Christy Belcourt's uh, floral designs. And chapters will include memoirs, our personal memoirs from the DDP, uh, excerpts and analysis from our TEK study, and our treaty study results, and then finally an overview of the glimpse. And that's all we have for you as far as presentation this evening. That's our contact information. If you want to contact us directly, uh, you can do that via email or by phone. And then uh, I should have put the website on for Reinhardt Associates while we yeah, but I didn't think about that. So I'll uh, stop sharing there. Uh, let's go on. Thank you so much, Marty and Tina, for your presentation. Um, yeah. So, so we would like to open it up to any questions that anyone has uh, for Marty, Tina, or for any of our uh, our speakers, Mariah. Or could I ask Frank? that somebody else monitor the Q and A while we're trying to answer questions? Yeah. Okay. Big wedge. All right, anyone from our live audience have any questions? Everybody's ready for a nap after dinner. <laughs> yeah. Eating such good food. And the presentation was so good that nobody has any questions because I answered them all. I'm just kidding. Hey again, Martin, this is Frank. Uh, yeah. Hey Frank. Um, I heard like 20 years ago when I was up in Mount Pleasant, I think uh, his name was D'Artania. He was working with the uh, um like the health of people up there in that region oh, and okay. i was a singer back then up there and i was talking to him about diet and stuff and he basically told me that like in the fall like in the like in the summer and in the in the in the harvest in the fall like our as a Nishnabe or as a, a indigenous diet that we had was more of like a south beach style diet and then in the uh, winter and in the spring, it was more of like an Atkins style diet. Have you ever heard yeah. anything like that? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Miigwech for that question, Frank. So yeah, when our ancestors, uh, when we were doing our food uh, seasonal rounds, you know, there's a reason why our calendars, our, our keeping track of time has a lot to do with food. You know, if you look at the Ojibwe calendar, everything in the months are about food and the relationship we have with the animals that we are around. And it's true, you know, our our uh, relationship with food during the summer, we were eating a lot of vegetables, fresh vegetables and fruit and, uh, you know, fish. It was, the, it was a time of plenty. And so, you know, that was something when the food was available, we were eating a lot of it. And it was, you know, it was a joyous time for us. It was uh, you know, the things we hadn't had all winter long, you know, the from springtime ephemerals to the things that we were able to find, you know, growing naturally in the summer to the things that we were gardening, the things that came up sooner rather than later. And then finally, the, the fall harvest. And then, you know, the other thing that's really important to remember, though, is that we were not consuming everything that we 
foraged, hunted, or fished, or gardened at that time, we were eating half and putting half away for winter. And so it's a question of, you know, how did our people dry things? How did they store things? And I think that's, you know, one of the things that we often forget is that uh, we had some pretty cool technology. I mean, you think about them, you know, you, you guys call yourself McCuckers, right? Yeah. And there's a reason you call yourself the McCuckers, because that's a very important component of our way of life is the storage of food uh, for those harder times. And so it's not like we didn't have summer uh, and springtime and early fall foods in the middle of winter, but it was a matter of if it was a good year and we did what we needed to do to put it away to get us through those really long, tough winters up here in, uh, in the North Country. But there's also a couple other things. And part of it is being respectful to the animals. Uh, when they have their young, we, we would leave them alone. Uh, in the summertime, there's uh, the, the rabbits. There was their, di their own digestive system was not good for us to be eating them in the summertime. So they were more of a winter food. So, I mean, there are things that uh, reasons why we ate the foods when we ate them. Yeah. You know, the other thing uh, you reminded me about, Frank, is I got a call one time during the Decolonizing Diet Project year. I got a call from the person who claims to be the uh, person that came up with the paleo diet. And I was like, oh, interesting. I can't remember that person's name now. But anyway, I, I got this call and and we were talking about the decolonizing diet project as compared to the paleo diet. And this person was suggesting that they were very similar. And so I was like, oh, OK, well, you know, that, that's interesting. Uh, but she said that uh, on the paleo diet, you know, the the true paleo diet, they didn't cook anything. I was like, well, we we certainly cook things. <laughs> you know, that's that's one of the things we like to do. I don't like to eat raw fish. You know, maybe some people do, but I don't. And so I think that to me, you know, it's not a matter of uh, uh, like laying claim to this. The the kind of knowledge that we had during the decolonizing diet project, this is ancestral knowledge that belongs to all of us. It belonged to our ancestors. It belongs to you. It belongs to me. Uh, the way they were approaching it is like trademark. Uh, you know, and it's it's also very interesting. I got a call, another call from this guy who wanted to know what my dog ate. And I was like, well, what do you mean? Why do you want to know that? He's like, well, yeah, well, you know, you're on this DDP. What is your dog eating? And at first, you know, I was like, oh, OK, well, that's an interesting question. And I uh, I was getting ready to answer him. You know, I thought it was really cool that someone was interested in my dog because I love my dog. And uh, I said, but but what are you going to do with this information? He said, well. I work for a dog food company. And I said, and what company is that? Uh, Purina. And I was like, oh, isn't Purina owned by Nestle? He's like, uh, yes. I was like, forget it, man. You ain't getting no nothing from me. So until Nestle gets out of the Great Lakes waters, you know, quits taking our Great Lakes waters. Anyway, so they never got my, uh, my dog food. But as far as the diets that you were referring to, uh, I, I, I'm not familiar with the diets and what they represent or anything but for uh the indigenous foods um we didn't have beef or chickens or, or pork. pork uh so we had no no dairy yeah. um the eggs that we got you know they were from the duck eggs oh and when we first started this he came up with this idea of things and i'm thinking okay we can't have chickens so i'm trying to think of how are we going to get duck eggs and i'm thinking oh my gosh we gotta go forage for duck eggs and how how do we do this which we could have but. yeah we could have but luckily there was you know chinary duck farm just down the road so yeah. that was very helpful so anyway i hope that answered your question thank you is there anything on the chat there's one um, in the chat there's i'm an asian settler and do not have um access to many of my cultural foods to decolonize my diet, I'd like to eat more indigenous American foods. I see a lot of sweet ingredients like berries included what um, included in what would traditionally be savory dishes in my culture. Can you please speak to the mix of these flavors? Yeah, sweet, savory, salty, spicy. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, there's the things that we're used to. You know, we have our favorite things that we, they're our go-to foods, right, on a, a daily basis or weekly. And when we don't get them, we're, we miss them. And I think that was one of the things that we dealt with on the Decolonizing Diet Project is, you know, we had our cravings. And so we found ways to fill those, uh, those gaps in our diet that we were missing. You know, when it came to spicy, one of the most spicy things that I ate uh, in, during the implementation phase was uh, nodding onion. Those uh, nodding onion um, seeds. Oh my gosh, if you ever put a nodding onion seed in your mouth, boom! That has so much spiciness to it. It's amazing. You know, the other thing, one of the more other spicy things that I ate was a red ant. Have you ever eaten red ants? They're spicy. Oh, my gosh. I, I, you know, it's amazing. So there are foods that uh, are spicy up here. It's not like we're devoid of spice or the things that we would consider spicy, uh, but they're not the same. Right. We don't have the chilies. We don't have those uh, jalapenos. We don't mm -hmm. have the things that people might be thinking about, like Tabasco sauce and stuff like that. So there's ways that you have to approach the idea of spicy differently. And the same thing with, uh, you know, the, the savory. You know, uh, as you're, you know, rendering down your meat and you're you're making, you know, the uh, different foods, you know, the mix of salt with a little bit of sweet and a little bit of that oniony flavor with the, uh, you know, the blood from the animals. And we didn't we didn't waste anything. You know, we kept it all and we tried to use it with, in whatever way we could. And so I think that's another really uh, respectful thing to do with the plants and animals here is, you know, take them from where they're at and understand your palate based on where you're located and try to maximize it. I always say, you know, here's the American diet. You know, that's what we're used to eating. Anything we want, anytime we want, right? Well, less maybe for people in rural areas, but I mean, it's pretty, pretty broad. The DDP is like this. It's a very small spectrum of food that's available to us. You know, when you're regionalizing it and localizing it, but what you do with that is you make it this deep. You maximize the ways that you put these foods together in creative different ways. Like I know Cam, uh, you know, he's really come up with some cool ideas, you know, and I really appreciate his creativity in indigenous foods. Uh, you know, when we were down there at Gun Lake uh, for the food summit a couple years back at the Ajijak camp, you know, there was that one uh, person that made the uh, wild rice, the Manoman uh, tortillas. You know, she she nixtamalized the wild rice and made tortillas. That was so cool, you know, to be able to have a tortilla made out of something that's from our region. You know, I, I like to use wild grape leaves to wrap stuff. You know, the wild grape leaves from the Great Lakes region. I like putting fish inside those, you know, with a little maybe uh, uh, splash of the vinegar and maybe some of the wood sorrel or sheep sorrel. You know, because there you have it, right? I mean, you know, it's the uh, spice that would normally be in lemon pepper. You know, it's a similar taste. You get that from vinegar mixed with the uh, grape leaves and the the sorrels. So good. Uh, so it, it it did take us a while to figure out um, how to spice our foods because we we were not familiar with it. We had to experiment to figure out what can we use. And so that's when. Uh, when we came up with the DDP spice blend. And there are like the vinegars, when we came up with the vinegar, oh, that was that was really a game changer for yeah. us because when, if you want some some flavor, some spice and stuff, and really a lot of our foods were, were pretty bland compared to what we have today. And so with those vinegars and that DDP spice blend, really that was a lot of what we used. That DDP spice blend is like Mrs. Dash for yeah. you know, DDP or <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any any other questions? Oh, uh, there are people asking about where to get the book. The oh, so the cookbook? Yes, the cookbook. Sorry. You can uh, if you go to reinhardassociates.net online, that is the, the company that Tina runs. That's our personal own company. And you can either get it there or you can go to the NMU bookstore. The NMU bookstore has usually has copies. Uh, if you're ordering in bulk,
like a lot of them. You might even want to just contact the Center for Native American Studies where I work and talk to the director, mm -hmm. Amber Morsa, uh, who uh, can then talk about, you know, bulk, bulk rates. Yep. We can also put the links to those on the, the NASA Facebook page. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, any other questions for our, our panelists and speakers? Oh, right. We're good. Sorry, good. <laughs> so then along with our food though too, um, our water, um, I know that we didn't just drink water. I mean, we had tea, you know, mints and, and roots and other things that we always had in our water. So maybe you can help us out with that a little bit, you guys. Yeah, so uh, teas, you know, they are, there are so many teas that the Anishinaabe alone, not, not thinking about other indigenous peoples, but my gosh, you go across Turtle Island and again, you know, the familiarity we have with the plants and, you know, there are, of course, there's medicine teas and then there's like the teas you drink on a daily basis. Uh, and sometimes you got to think about that, right? Because food is medicine in, a, in its largest perspective. And if you consume too much of any one thing, it can be harmful. You know, you don't want to overindulge. So my suggestion is this, you know, I like uh, maple syrup. I like maple products. I pour about a six second count into the bottom of a gallon of water. That's my sweet water. I reconstitute maple sap. Uh, and then it's my, it's my Ojibwe Kool-Aid, right? I get to satisfy my craving for sweet okay. and I get to have that on a daily basis. I, I can drink that all day long. and to me, it's it's very healthy because one, it comes from Mother Earth. There's nothing else in it except water and uh, sap, and it's so much better than drinking those soda pops and and Gatorades and all that other crap. You know, that's just really hurting people and causing diet. You know, causing us uh, diabetes and obesity. So I think that's one thing is to you know kind of have your go-to, and sweet water is a good go-to. Uh, but then, you know, there's the, the teas that you guys are drinking there tonight. You can go out your back door, a lot of us, and grab those pine needles. Uh, it, so, it sounds like you guys have uh, wintergreen down there. Uh, just be careful. Again, you know, you don't want to overindulge. You also don't want to overboil. Uh, something that we learned is about overboiling your teas. Uh, sometimes you're just supposed to steep them. Sometimes you, if it's for medicine purposes, you want to really boil them. But you need to leave the medicine to the medicine people. You know, if you're not a medicine person, someone that knows a lot about traditional medicine, don't assume that you understand it until you really, you know, have an opportunity to sit down with someone and talk about those things and, and actually, you know, learn from them. There were a variety of different teas that, uh, you know, it was nice when we had our potlucks and our gatherings and stuff that we were able to um, taste some of the other teas that other people were making yeah. uh, we have our our favorites that we we make um we haven't ventured very far from that uh but it was nice to get get together and taste something different every once in a while to see what other people liked yeah you mentioned mary moose earlier frank and you know mary when she goes out and gathers tea leaves it's a lot of tea leaves i mean that that woman she knows so much stuff mm -hmm. i mean she's a walking encyclopedia of knowledge about those things those plants and animals uh but tina and i some of our favorite you know it's a uh, white pine wintergreen uh we like sweet fern tea mm -hmm. uh you know cedar tea again cedar can also be used as medicinal uh, labrador labrador okay. tea mm -hmm. gotta be careful too much yep. labrador tea can make you feel like a light hallucination like so, you're you know getting a little bit lightheaded you know mm -hmm. so gotta be careful with those teas but you know there's a lot of them out there uh some of those teas uh, yeah, sumac uh, lemonade, uh, uh, yeah. steakhorn sumac Steak lemonade. Horn. Yeah, make sure you get the right sumac. Yeah, don't get the wrong sumac. Um, you know, but that, in, uh, in the, sassafras. Sassafras, yep. yep. There's a lot uh, of sassafras we, down here. I don't know if they have it up there, but there's a lot down here. Yeah, yeah I've um, seen a lot more down there. Ginger, here. wild ginger. Uh, horse you know, mint. A, yeah, the mint. Yeah, the mint teas. Uh, be careful, you know, I mean, sometimes those uh, plants that are okay for some people to consume are not okay for others. 
you know, I have people that have allergies that have tasted some of these teas and, you know, like chaga, you know, people know what chaga is, uh, you know, that skitagan, uh, when, you know, when I, when I drink it, my heart palpitates, I can't drink it. I love, I wish I could. Tina can drink it all day long and doesn't affect her the same way. Uh, same thing with, uh, like, uh, what is it? The uh, raspberry tea leaves, you know, that can cause some women to go into labor, you know? Uh, so just be careful, you know, when it depends on how your body deals with it. All right. Thank you. I think we have one more question from the chat. Uh, it, it's just about local uh, water sources. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, Frank, one of the things that he was saying is we also have to protect our water. You know, water is the lifeblood of Mother Earth. It's we all have to depend on it. So I'm a little I'm not a little hard on Enbridge. I'm really hard on Enbridge. You know, I'm hard on Enbridge. I'm hard on Nestle. You know, anything that is affecting our waters uh, is affecting Mother Earth. It's affecting our ability to offer a bright future to those seven generations that are coming. You know, we have to protect it at all costs. And, you know, when we're talking about uh, fresh water, you know, what is it, 20%? 20% of the world's fresh water is in the Great Lakes region. That's an enormous amount. So we have a huge responsibility. You know, not only do we have rights, Aboriginal rights, treaty rights, civil rights, we have responsibilities to protect those things, not just for humans, but for all living beings. You know, Mother Earth is a living being and it's our duty to protect her and so i think that is core to that relationship is to protect the water but as far as like a practical thing like what are like local water sources maybe the question was maybe uh that way well again you know one of the things that we can do is we can get water from plants and that water has been filtered you know those trees that uh when it runs up the sap you know, that's a good source of water. Just again, be careful. Sometimes, you know, if you drink too much of that sap coming out of the tree can cause you to have, you know, diarrhea if you're not used to that and stuff. So, you know, you just got to be careful. You don't drink water from like uh, stagnant pools. You know, if you come up to a mud puddle, don't drink it. There's a lot of stuff going on in there. Uh, drink, you know, flowing water, fresh water, you know, from springs and stuff. And uh, also boil, boil your water. You know, that's we have uh, indigenous ways to boil. You know, I was just in a sweat lodge two nights ago. You know, those hot rocks, those grandfathers are good medicine, not just for making us sweat, but also for boiling our water. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think uh, we're we're good here. If 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 there are no more questions, I think. Oh, one more here. Here, hold on, hold on. We need to uh, get over here. There, thank you. Um, I noticed on your plant list that you had the first one. There were some of the Polygonian family, the uh, the knotweeds, and uh, before corn arrived and before contact, um, indigenous people were domesticating um, plants like that, pseudo grains and grains, little barley. And I was yeah. wondering if you were able to find any of those or incorporate some of those in the diet as well. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I did was incorporated uh, the uh, lamb's quarter seeds, you know, and uh, red amaranth. Uh, you know, there are some, what I, I don't know, what can't remember what you just called them. But anyway, they're pre-colonial grain plants. And uh, those are really important because they, one, they give us diversity and variety in our diet, uh, but they also have necessary nutrients that you may not get from other things. Like uh, one of my favorite is lamb's quarter. You know, I love lamb's quarters because they grow so well uh, all year long and they grow uh, quickly in the spring in those disturbed areas by your gardens and along your footpaths. And they have more nutritional value than spinach. I mean, people are all about spinach, man. I'd rather, much rather have a plate full of lab, uh, lamb's quarters, you know, man, and that makes me feel good. And it, it wants to be there. I don't have to grow it. it. It's like, man, pick me, eat me. So, yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, uh, where people are able to uh, get those, um, 
those grain type foods. I think that's a really good thing to uh, learn about and to incorporate into your diet. And also don't, don't get all on this uh, quinoa kick, right? We're, we're, you know, it's good for the people to eat quinoa where quinoa is from, but you know, we don't need to be all eating quinoa up here. You know, we got plenty of uh, grain foods up here that we can eat. Let's like quinoa if that's your thing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Frank, would you like to close us out today? Yeah, I would like to recognize a tribal council member here from the Gun Lake tribe, uh, Tommy. Who's you, Tommy? She's at, a, she's at our council here with Gun Lake tribe. So she's a, a tribal leader in the Southwest Michigan here for her beautiful First Nation. She's also married to one of my best friends. <laughs> uh, again. Uh, my nephew here, Angus Bush, and I are going to sing a song that his dad gave to me a while ago. Um, and this is another song that doesn't belong at the powwow or doesn't belong at the 49 or or when you're having fun, uh, the song, because we called in those spirits to be with us wherever we are. Uh, with that song that I sang, that spirit song, calling song, we have to release that too in that good way. And so this is our closing song for this epic, uh, prestigious event, our, our annual, our inaugural. All right. talks about our world and the spirit world as we leave here we walk by each other going back to where we come from and then that second half of that song was our american indian movement song the aim song is there referred to it was a grass stance song and during that wounded knee um there was a man that was murdered they dug him up later he was a grass dancer and it was a police revolver bullet that shot him in the back and it was his favorite song. Only two people knew that song when they repatriated, repatriated his body back into the ground. By the end of that, 
Everybody was humming that song that was from Dennis Banks that gave me that story. Oh, miigwech. Just want to say miigwech to everybody. You know, uh, Frank, uh, Tari, Cam, Rachel, Mariah, Chef Werner, and all the people in the audience. It was, uh, we really wish we could have been down there to join you, but we really enjoyed being with you virtually. Thank you very much. And thank you to thank everyone. You. Yes, you're, you're getting claps, applause. <laughs> and thank you, everyone. Uh, and that's all we have for you tonight. Thank you for coming.